Okay, everybody. Well, we've got a treat coming up next um, because I'm going to be talking to psychologist, author, and academic Jeff Beatty, Professor Jeff Beatty, who is professor at Edgehill University in the UK. And he's had an incredibly uh, long and distinguished career in the fields of uh, psychology uh, as an academic, but he's also had parallel careers as an author, as a writer, as a journalist, and he's um, known for a number of different things, and you might know him for his work on TV, where he's a sort of a popular psychologist, or at least he, he um, explains to us some of what's going on, in, and in particular in nonverbal communication, which um, is uh, quite interesting, particularly if somebody sticks their finger up at you. Or, um, or winks, or, 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 or does something else. So we'll be talking a bit about that. But um, uh, Jeff, can you hear and see me? I can hear and see you fine. Very sure, good, yeah. and, we, and we can hear and see you with it. Thank you very much for, for joining us um, today. And you're joining us because um, I've asked you uh, if, you'd, if you'd kindly give up some time to talk about your new book, which is Selfless. Um, and... Um, so this is sort of an autobiography, and I'll say sort of an autobiography because it sort of weaves together parts of your life, but also some of the some of your writings and some of your thoughts on psychology. And it's a bit of an intellectual journey as well because you sort of tell us how you've got from point A to point B. So, so first of all, um, why why did you write the book, and what, what's this book about? Oh, why did I write the book? Well, like most books, there's a kind of uh, you have a sensation inside which says something needs to come out here. And I think that's where the book started. Um, I wanted to write about my background and how I got into psychology. And I come from a particular social background, which is kind of lower working class. I was born in Belfast. Um, my father was a motor mechanic. My mum worked in the mill. Um, I went to the local school. And at that local school, nobody ever passed the 11 plus. <laughs> So I was the first in the generation to pass it, which obviously opened up a world of opportunity. Um, and just to describe, I, I, to, sorry, just 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 to pick you up on that. So the eleven plus is it's an exam that you take at eleven, and, and, and what what's that for? Okay, it's an exam you take at eleven, which is uh, meant to be a kind of measure of, of intelligence and ability at, at that age. Which and the idea behind that is that it, it, it directs you to, to the kind of secondary education you get. If right. you pass, you get a choice of, of, of very good academic schools, independent schools and grammar schools. If you fail, you go to a secondary modern school. So it kind of determines your life course, really. So, so, so in it's, terms it's, of it's, social class, then, that is sort of your passport or your potential passport to sort of out of your social class. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and it's, it, it, it is a big deal because I think as an 11-year-old, you kind of understand how important it is. And obviously, a lot of schools, a lot of good primary schools, would prepare their their children for this test. But the school I went to, there was no preparation because the assumption was everyone would fail. Uh, the assumption was everyone would fail. But but at, this, at the, my primary school, I was a little bit different because I I skipped a lot of the classes because I was seemed to be quite good at, at certain uh, academic things. So uh, from my last few years of primary school, I used to mark the spellings. And the arithmetic of the other kids. I used to sit in a little desk on my own in the middle. So oh, wow. I was even then seen as a little bit different. And of course, that, that, that came with its own challenges because my friends, I was marking their spellings and arithmetic. <laughs> and, and I tell the story in the uh, in, in the book about some boys drop some barley. They used to shoot barley for a teacher. And the teacher lined up everyone to be keen. And of course, I didn't want to be left out because that would be seen to be right. different. From that. So I lined up, even though I didn't bring barley. Right, right, right. But keen. So so it, it, there was that kind of interesting juxtaposition even before 11. But at 11, I, I kind of did the 11 plus and I, and I passed. And then at that point, I had to then go to, to, to be interviewed by, by this school. I, my parents just showed me a list of schools. And I picked the poshest sounding school on the list because it had the word royal in it, Belfast Royal Academy, which is the oldest school in the city. So I, right. I was invited to, 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 to go and be interviewed. And the interview went reasonably well out. Uh, the headmaster came in with a gown on. I'd obviously never seen anyone with a gown on before. Started asking me a lot of questions about myself. And then uh, I, I described in the book, he asked me the last novel I'd read. And the okay. problem was I'd never, read, I'd never read a novel. We didn't have novels in the last. We, right. we, had, we had lots of books. Uh, <laughs> um, and when I was a child, I had a bit of a fixation with encyclopedias. I used to like remembering facts 
I used to get my dad to ask me facts and encyclopedias. But he asked me about the last novel I read. And uh, I, I, I hadn't, I'd say I hadn't read one, but I had been to, to a kind of memorial hall to watch the film Gulliver's Travels. Oh, okay. I, I had an encyclopedia of famous authors, so I knew that Jonathan Swift wrote this book. And uh, so I described the film, but I, I didn't watch, I couldn't describe all of them because we'd been thrown out. We were a little, you know, gang of kids who liked messing about. We were all, every time we went to the cinema, we were thrown out. <laughs> we were thrown out halfway through to throw marbles. We used to throw marbles from the, uh, from the top deck, uh, which is very funny. If you've never done it, I, mean, I shouldn't describe a ballad act as being funny, but You it's don't do funny. it anymore, but yes. Uh, I, 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 well, we <laughs> should say that, okay. <laughs> I have been tempted. I have been tempted. We'll cut that bit out, yes. So we were, you know, when, when the lights go on, it's very dark. Suddenly you hear these noises coming from the auditorium. Anyway, we were all kicked out. I got a little whack as well. And um, so I described the, the book up to the point where we were kicked out of the cinema. And um, he obviously thought I'd got a very good visual imagination. Right. <laughs> it was very cinematic by description. So uh, <laughs> I got into the school. So... So I had to go. I got into the school, but which was quite a distance from from where I lived, really. So all my friends went one way, and then at eleven, I was going somewhere else to this new school, which which obviously was quite intimidating. Yes. And so and so, you, so you you get into the school, and yes. your your studies go, your studies go pretty well, um, but th- that's that's not the only thing going on. So this isn't this is in the context. This is Belfast in the nineteen sixties, correct? And what's and yeah. what's going on? Well, what, what's going on? It, it, it's the kind of build up to to, to the trouble. So it, it's a quite. I'm I'm a Protestant from Belfast, um, and I lived in a in a street full of mill houses where it was just Catholic and and Protestant neighbours really. So my next door neighbour was a Catholic. The one yet, the next one up was also a Catholic. Very large family, some of them. And obviously, my friends at that time were a mixture of Protestants and Catholics, and and the Catholic families because there were so many kids were were terribly poor. So these houses had had, you know, it was uh, kind of two up, two down. So there's two bedrooms. So um, uh, there was no bathroom, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. And we did, in fact, we didn't have a bath. We didn't even have a tin bath because that had rusted. So uh, and obviously, my friends who were called the Rocks, who were two doors off, they had twelve living in the house. So mm-hmm. so you know, so with with a bed in, in in the front room kind of thing uh, for mm-hmm. people to sleep in. So you have twelve people in the house. That's the house. <laughs> it, it, it does tend to get a bit cramped. So, so it was, and and some of the families were quite poor. We never thought of ourselves as poor, of course. We could we could afford stuff. Although, I, I, again, as I say in the book, the biggest arguments we ever had was about the electric bar. We had one source of heat, which was an yes. electric bar, and the one and bar, was, <laughs> one bar, and one bar only. <laughs> if you try to put on more than one bar, it was a real issue. So, so it, it was it was kind of the build up to the troubles, where uh, you, you were very aware of who was a Protestant, who was a Catholic. Um, mm. But things hadn't really started then. They started, of course, in 1969. Right. Um, and, and, and my street and the people who were part of my gang, uh, of course, you know, working class, Protestant, working class Catholics were exactly the kind of people. So within a few years, people would become kind of enemies and, and so on. And, and, and I was, of course, I was still at school when the, when the troubles started. So, so part of my uh, education at, at the academy was kind of, you know, learning about stuff. But at the same time, this this was going on all around. Um, my, my dad died, or very unfortunately, when I was thirteen. So it left my brother and my mother and I in the house, and then my brother, who became a climber, so he was on his way climbing. So it left my mother and I. So two of us living in in the house. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of homework to do every night, which I which I really enjoyed. It was never it was never a chore for me. But my my mother would moan about lack of company first of all, that I wouldn't talk. Right. Uh, and her biggest terror in life was me becoming something that I wasn't, you know. Yes. Uh, I could become a, a snob. She always prefaced with we, a wee snob because she was always worried I'd somehow look down my nose because yes. the, the people I was being educated with. I wasn't mixing with the people, by the way, that I went to school with. Um, I think the whole time I went there, only once did anyone come to my house and I was, he wanted some help with, so with some you, work. So did you feel then um, that your... Your, your friends in the new school were, did you really feel that as a difference? You felt you didn't belong there? Yeah, I, I, I had an incredibly strong Belfast accent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, it's not just the accent, it's, it's the whole way you speak. So I was saying one, one kind of very distinctive feature of Belfast speech is uh, people say, you know, all the time. So I would go, I would say something, I'd say, you know, you know. Right. 
And uh, he, and he, he, one of the teachers called me out on it one day and said, "Look, Biddy, I know that I know. Stop saying you know all the time." <laughs> but of course, uh, later as a psycholinguist, I learned that these things are called parenthetic remarks, and you right. use them to fill time. I hit when I was young. I hit it. If I didn't answer things fluently, I thought I, I wasn't very smart, so I fill the time with ums and ahs and you knows, and it's like yes. I, I just sounded very hesitant. Yes, <laughs> and also uh, working class, especially working class Belfast speech is very simple. We have right. a kind of rising intonation at the ends of our statements. So it always sounds as if I wasn't very sure of what I was saying. And I think the boys in my school thought, what have we here? Um, uh, I got called a pleb a few times. I didn't know what a pleb was. Even though I was studying Latin, I thought plebeian. Something to do with plebeian. I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> so I, th- I think they regarded me as being uh, a little bit different. Um, and it, I tried to keep the two worlds apart. We, the school I went to, we had a school cap. We had to wear with it. Royal crest on the cover of school blaze with a royal crest. So you can imagine leaving Lakemore Street dressed like this. Right. <laughs> it got a bit of attention. So the guys who I, who I, who I, uh, I knew from primary school were my, my friends and my gang, the ones I hung out with, just thought they knew I was good at, at academic work, you know, and they right. used to make jokes about it. Um, but then I, I'd have to, I set off with this. I would, obviously, I wouldn't wear the cap in the street. <laughs> I put the cap on. <laughs> Yeah, about two yards from the school, even I though did. it was a school rule preventing you from doing right, that. Right, right, but, right. But it was keeping these, keeping these worlds apart. I knew I had to keep the worlds apart. Um, I knew I had to do a lot of work. And, um, of course, in a tiny house, that brings its own challenges. So my mum would say to me, would you go down to the shop and get a pint of milk? Right. And I'd say, no, I can't. I'm working. She said, you're not working. You're just sitting there. Right, and I right, said, right. yeah, that's work. She said, so sitting in your ass is just work these days, is it? It's just, right. you're not doing right. anything. I said, I'm thinking. It's like, yes. <laughs> how do you prove your thinking, you know, or, or I'm learning something. Like um, <laughs> I, I, I did a lot of, I did 12 old levels, so I did, I did both kind of arts and science and languages. Um, and I, I, I was, I did maths, physics and chemistry, and Russian, which I was always interested in. And of course, the joke about Russian was that obviously <laughs> none of my parents spoke Russian or Latin or French or anything else. Uh, but my dad, when he was alive, used to ask me all my things and, Obviously, he didn't know what I was saying. I just put through right. all the clips. Um, and then, obviously, you know, when he had died, I put through them on my own. And my mum would say, are you talking to yourself? Right. And I right. said, no, no, I'm learning a Russian declension. She said, it sounds like you're talking to yourself. And it's like, and it's like, and I suppose that's, the, the book, of course, is called Selfless. And it's about this notion of, uh, as a working class boy, I knew the incredible opportunities education was offering. Yes. But I suppose... What nobody ever warns you about is, is what that journey, you know, it's such a, it's such a, right. such a cliche about a journey, but nobody yes. ever warns you what the journey is going to feel like. Uh, and it's this notion that I, it was kind of leaving my gang, leaving my mother in a way, because the two of us were stuck in that house. Right. But I was like, my activities were, were structured now and different to hers. And the interesting thing is that she was also a very clever woman, actually, because yes. the headmaster had said that I was the cleverest pupil of that primary school. So or a generation before, so <laughs> he would have had to give opportunities, but of course yes. life had changed in, yes. in the meantime, so I was being given a lot of opportunities, and, uh, and, and, and yet the tension was obviously there, and also her fear, I mean, fear about me becoming a snob, fear about me leaving, actually, because you kept that's, saying... Well, that's interesting, isn't it, because cause, cause you've got a um, uh, the, the two sort of sides there, because you've got education as this uh, as this path, this journey, but it's also very much seen as a way out. Um, and so, so you've got this this double thing, because I think if you come from uh, an educated background, then the education of your children or the education of children is so you can bring them up to your level. So so if, 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 if you like, you can then have conversations with them about all the things which you've also learned, which which form part of this this sort of wider canon of, of, of knowledge of, of the things you should know. Um, Whereas if you're if you're born from um, if you're born to sort of working p- class parents, you've you've got the two things as represented there. And clearly, with your father, he was he was enjoying vicariously um, perhaps that the performative side of things. Of look, see, my my son's doing what he should do, which I suppose is the traditional role of the father of of, of you know um, preparing you to, so so that he knows you're going to make it in life. And then and then juxtapose with 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 your mother who who knows that this is her. A wee boy becoming perhaps a wee snob, or at least um, distancing himself, and and of course going into his head, which which of course again is is a way in which we distance ourselves, even if we're there. No, I I, I think they're both very very good observations. Actually, 
and, and, and I think that was that was exactly right. And, and I think there's this kind of fear of of, of this business of education is going to pull us apart. Uh, and and she was always looking for reassurance, even with the troubles in our age, by the way, and my right. friends being in the troubles, um, that somehow I'd go up to university. And I kept reassuring her that I wouldn't, that I'd go to Queen's in Belfast. And I'd, I'd, I'd kind of live at home. And, and obviously, when I was preparing for A-levels, I'd, I'd go up to the library at Queen's. And of course, you couldn't get home because there'd be road plots and, and right. balls going off. Right. It was time of just getting back to this bit of North Belfast, which was, which was particularly badly affected. So. Uh, I, I suppose I could kind of understand her uh, her anxieties about uh, about the whole thing, and, and and obviously there was no one to talk to about any of the stuff that any of the knowledge I was acquiring. If I tried to talk to her, she would have seen that I was getting a kind of kind of above myself, really. Uh, and and yet I wasn't talking to my school friends about it either, because after my dad died, and this is a a weird thing. I, I took up running, and I used to run every lunchtime right. at school. Every, I mean, every lunchtime. Um, and I still run every day, by the way. And now I run for Ireland, uh, which is good, so it's kept me fit. Um, uh, but um, so I didn't really mix with them and chat to my school friends. I just, I just did the, the academic work. So all the dialogue was going on in my head. Um, and that's why exams were important, because it was my only way of showing that actually there was something in there that made sense. I wasn't discussing with anyone. Else. And because of my accent, I was a little bit nervous about talking in class. Right. The only thing I ever did in class was make jokes. Yes. Uh, to get people to laugh and get their teachers, to be honest, a bit uh, upset by it. Maybe. <laughs> which so you did, did, so yeah. you didn't quite know how to how to sort of use that side of you, which which was becoming in your head, which, which would perhaps like to engage with these ideas um, and and present them. But it's 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 sometimes difficult. It's uh, and I, I I find this with because um, uh, I I also come from a, uh, a working class background, and, and and when I was younger, if I had read something. Uh, and I wanted to sort of say, oh, this is like something I've read. I, I couldn't. You, you could refer to a film. You know, you could say this is like Rocky when this is this. But, but you couldn't yes, refer yeah. to a book because what one no. was would be, well, what, what are you talking about? You didn't have the same the same sort of um, reference, um, if you like. But, well, 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 exactly. And, 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 of course, surprise, surprise, I was now starting to read literature. And, of right. course, I was reading Dostoevsky and Turgenev and, and Tolstoy in Russian. So I'd gone from a boy who hadn't read any novels to a boy who was reading them in Russian. Yes. Who was I going to discuss any of that with? It was like, uh, so, so that was always going to be a difficult one. And, and, but part of what I was doing at school was whenever I had to, to publicly communicate with homework and so on, was a bit of a pretense. So I like to tell the story that I was in the top class for everything except English, which, which, which is, didn't really make sense to me because I, my marks were as, you know, uniform. Um, and, and I remember in the fourth form, I had to write an essay about, the essay was called My Favourite Uncle. I wrote, a, you know, the tip, my, my typical essay at the time was, yes, my uncle is uh, very rich. He's a big game hunter. He's just back from Africa. And I remember <laughs> once writing all this stuff. <laughs> and uh, I, I got halfway through, and I just suddenly thought, what are you doing? Right. Why are you pretending? This is just right. rubbish. Right. Right. So I tore it up. My mum came in. I remember that I've got a flashbulb memory of my mum coming in the room. And I'm ripping all this paper up. And she said, oh, my God, you've lost a head. You've lost a head. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to pay for all these books. You know, it's like, right. God, this is rubbish. And I wrote a, a story about my uncle, who, who wasn't a big gamer, who, who went to the pub with my dad every Saturday night. And right. I wrote a story about, about their lives. And when he came home, the dog used to attack him. And the do our, our dog <laughs> only attacked him when he was drunk. <laughs> it was like, so I wrote a story about my life. And, uh, right. and then I wrote another story about me and this crazy dog, half Alsatian, half Collie, that lived down the street. I looked after him. It's about me and this dog were always getting in trouble. He used to follow me. To school, actually, right. <laughs> uh, it wasn't my dog, but I used to look after it, and and I wrote a real story about it. It, it, it attacked a sheep one day, um, which was a, a nightmare in my young life because I thought if if it gets caught, it's going to be terrible consequences. So, and, and I wrote this, and the English teacher asked to see me, and he said, "Look, this is really interesting. It's really good." And it, I was moved from the set I was in to the top set within a, a, you know that day. Uh, <laughs> I, and that was me becoming authentic for the first time, at least admitting right. to something. Right. right. Uh, at least just to the teacher. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have talked in detail to my school friends about it, but they kind of knew because of where I came from, right. and because Belfast is only really a small city, they knew if any of them ever saw me, they knew who I was with. In a sense, yes, I was with a yes. you know, gang of lads who, right. you know, unfortunately became quite well known in the troubles. But, but they were my friends. These were my guys. 
So, so you're, you're, you're sort of um, uh, finding uh, at least that authenticity is, is something into which you can plug. And of course, that's a different, uh, it's a difficult thing for a kid because you're, you're wondering what, um, what do these adults expect? What do they want from me? Um, if, if you like, and because there's that aspect in, in, in which you, you need to perform, you need to do well, and 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 you obviously are. Um, but so you you're doing this. You're obviously academically brilliant, and you you're going towards um, university. But how how did you come to uh, be interested in psychology? What what was the the hook? Oh, <laughs> well, growing grew up in Belfast, in some sense, it was an easy one. <laughs> Because, so as I was doing my A-levels, obviously the troubles were now on. And I suppose my interest in psychology was just watching what was, watching what was happening. So suddenly our neighbours were becoming our enemies. And I never kind of understood that. To be honest. I thought, hang on a second. Why is this? <laughs> what, what exactly is happening here? Yes. Uh, and it was this kind of polarisation. We were all sensitive to the notions of Protestants and Catholics. Very sensitive, in fact. Because again, I tell the story in the book about I discovered a, a friend of mine, excuse me, one of the rocks told me that my uncle Terence was a Catholic. This was like, this was horrific. This was like the worst thing right. imaginable, imaginable. And that uh, was like, um, and, and nobody in my family had ever told me because when I was a child, they used to make me sing that great Protestant anthem, the sash my father wore straight into his face. And I never understood the joke. Wow. But um, so we were always aware of it. Uh, but and, and he was my father's best friend, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but incredibly, wasn't allowed into his uh, sister in law's house for 40 years. Wow. So I, I wasn't aware of any of this. I mean, we were sensitive to it, but there were kind of secrets and lies, which was weird. Right. But suddenly, yeah. with, with but it was managed there, under the surface, it was managed very much managed like under the very surface. Much. Yeah, it was never talked about, right? Um, okay. Uh, I mean, I mean, the, the, me singing the sash, I never understood why I was considered funny. I had right. to sing, you say, sing it to your uncle Terence, he loves that song. And I'd yes. sing it to him. Because uh, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, was married to him, you know, and the sash was upstairs. Right. So I, 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 and my uncle Terence couldn't marry uh, my dad, who was my mum's sister, until after he died. I didn't know any of this. I just right. thought, oh, they married a bit later in life, you know, which is really unusual. Uh, so we were always aware of this, but, but as I say, it wasn't as if, you know, the, the way the troubles were sometimes portrayed, you had this privileged Protestant class and, and, the, and the downtrodden Catholics. Well, we yes, were the yes, poor yes. Protestants. Yeah, we were in the same right. mills. We were working in the same mills. Um, and funny enough, we lived in the same houses since right. they were built, you know, at the end of the 19th century. It was like, um, so, so it was, uh, yeah. It, 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 so there was this other aspect. So, so the psychology was kind of there, really, because watching, watching how people change, how they change their attitudes to each other, how, how division develops. I was kind of watching all of that, I suppose. Mm. Um, and, and, I, 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 and I think also at the time, psychology was a bit of a rebellious act. I think because I, I was so good at physics and chemistry, they, they, people just assumed I would go off to a certain, certain kinds of universities right. to physics. Um, you, can, I, can I ask, if, um, were you um, cognizant at that point also of how, um, because you've had parallel media careers, we'll, we'll get onto that later, but were you cognizant of how um, you were being represented, your your community um, at the time with within different media outlets. So, I mean, would you read about yourself or or see a, a TV report and think that that doesn't make sense? Yeah, the TV reporting of the troubles was was, was was kind of interesting because obviously I went through some kind of huge changes, um, um, and you know, I, I, I describe in the book how you know I was in a riot. I did, did I take part in riots? I was there. <laughs> yes. I, I suppose what I was trying to do was I was, you know, I tried to describe what it's like to be caught up in something, not an active, actively involved. But funny enough, some of the things I was, I was out where I was there, I, I also watched it being described and explained. Right. I, and, and I suppose what struck me early on was that I think what struck me about my being involved in a rioting situation was that people were there, there for all kinds of reasons, and I think the experience of people is very different and what i remember most about the first riot i i, I was kind of not I, I, i'm trying to think of what what the, what the word is i, I not in, i wasn't involved i wasn't rioting but I, I was physically present was some woman giving us um uh handkerchiefs to bathe their eyes when we were tear gas and i remember thinking that in some sense was one of the most kind things i've ever seen so 
but but I suppose when you watch it on the television, you think, oh, it's a homogeneous group. It's just a set of people. Right. They're all as one and so on, and they've all got violent intentions. Like I think it's about diversity within the group. And I, and I suppose, I mean, I mean, maybe it was my first lesson in this notion that from an abstract point of view, people all look the same. Right. And I, I think from an abstract point of view, all working class people at the school I went to all look the same right. uh, and are all the same. And I suppose what was coming to my mind was that nobody really understood the diversity even in Lakewood Street where I grew up. You know, I knew that I, I was really lucky with my parents. I think other kids in the, in the street didn't have, weren't so lucky. And, and, and I suppose it, what I became really interested in was this notion of, of the relationship between the, the particular experiences we have and our actions. So again, that I was forcing the psychology agenda, I think. And, and, and also this notion that that um, the media too often kind of reinforces these really abstract notions of groups and people. And I kept thinking, all I could see was individuals within them. You know? right. and, and, and again, as, as, the, as the conflict developed, of course, I, uh, I, I, I had grown up with some of the people who became quite well known in the conflict. And again, I kept thinking about their psychological journey to end up doing what they did, which right. in a completely unpredictable way, you know, in terms yes. of if you had to identify individuals. So, so I suppose. Um, Sometimes it seemed that the media and psychology were, were offering me very different perspectives on, on the same kind of same kind of issues. Quite quite contrasting perspectives. Okay. So so then so, so then this this interest develops in psychology, and you you don't stay at, um, in Belfast. You you go across the pond to um, to Cambridge. Um, oh, no, I went to the University of Birmingham first. Oh, sorry, you you go to the University of Birmingham. Sorry about that. Um, and when when you go to England, had you had you spent much time in England before that? No, but my, my aunt and uncle had 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 moved to Bath, um, uh, um, which was a big shock to my mum and 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 to me. So I, I had spent a few summers there, okay. uh, and, you know, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, uh, working for a while. You know, and I used to work in building sites for them. So of course, they called me Paddy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wrong religion, <Price>. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get a pay slip with Paddy written on it, which was great. Uh, um, so I, I, I've been a little bit to England. I, I didn't know Birmingham at all. I, picked, I, 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 I got some recommendation from a psychologist recommended by the school. He said, the University of Birmingham has got a good psychology department. I've never been. I thought, when I got there, oh my God, this is a big place. <laughs> I'd right. never been before. But I, I loved it. I, I loved the university. I loved the psychology department. And, and it was so odd kind of leaving. And of course, and, and and that was an odd experience because I was now reading about the troubles on newspapers, right? And interestingly, talking less about my background, even even less about my background. Um, so, so, so were, were you always going to be an academic? Do you think, or um, or were you you know well, were well, you well, attracted by because you you've never practiced, have you, as a Clinical no, I, I, I've, I've never practiced. I, I mean, what was interesting was when I got to Birmingham, my, my family had always made me believe that I did so well at school because I because I worked so hard. You know, I had this image that I was the hardest work. And then I got to university, and I thought, well, it's like everyone appears to be working harder than me, spending <laughs> more time in the library. And everyone was quite shocked. And I remember at Birmingham, I, I I I came top, and I, I I got a prize, and did, and, and there was a, like a cross faculty prize, which was for a Creative essay. Everyone assumed that's what it was for. It was like they couldn't put the person who, who, who looked right. like me and this prize together. together. It was like it didn't make any sense. Right. And, and I suddenly thought, oh, hang on a second. Because my brother always said, oh my God, you're such a swap. Um, uh, and, and then I realized that I, I, I academic work kind of, kind, of, kind of came quickly to me. Um, right. I still wasn't as confident, but start, this confidence was starting to develop now uh, a little bit. And, and I suddenly thought, oh, and and in my funny enough, in my third year, I, I had, did think about clinical psychology, and I went along to my favorite lecturer and talked to him about it. And he said, "Look, you have seen your academic record, and and, and you know, if you wanted to, you could, you could be an academic. You know, you could go and do a PhD. You know, you know. So so uh, and I had a very good supervisor in my third year called Ross Bradbury, and, and she developed my my interest in, in language. And I, I did some work on pauses in speech, you know, hesitations, and uh, yeah." How they relate to models of linguistic production. And I said to my mom, she said, What are you doing, son? And I said, I'm working on pauses. She 
Because <laughs> my mum always says, yeah, you've got to think about animals. And she talks about the pose, the pose dog. Uh, and, I, I, and I had a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a, a pie pack, because it's quite funny with, with animals. And um, years later, I went back to um, the belt, took my mum to one of the kind of paramilitary drinking clubs, which is and uh, one of the kind of big godfathers of the organization was uh, sitting in the corner and, and I went to the bar and he jumped up and I thought, oh my God, I'm in trouble here. And he said to me, Jeffrey Beatty. I said, that's right, yeah. He says, I remember you when you were a boy. You're like a bloody pipe pepper. All the bloody dogs in the streets were before you arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so all I was famous for in my street was bloody making friends with animals. It was like, anyway, so she thought I was talking about the pauses of the dog. Not, not the different different times of pauses, yes. Yeah. Yeah, different types of pauses, but I uh, don't know what the plural of pauses, pauses, but yeah, so I became really interested in language, um, and, and I thought this could be quite exciting, and she encouraged me to apply for PhDs in a variety of places, like Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, and so on, so I applied to Sussex, so I applied to a, to a number of universities. And then and then you, you end up going to Cambridge, and yeah. and, and of course, what's, what, what's, what's that like for you? How do, how do you fit in? <laughs> well, I, I did my, my Belfast Royal Academy trip all, all over again. When I had to apply for a college, I, I went, I thought they'll not accept me anyway, so I might as well go for the top one. You, know, you, but you didn't write about uncles in the Cayman Islands, did you? I don't <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I, I just didn't mention the uncles anymore. So, so I applied to Trinity and, and I'm, I was amazed when they, when they accepted me. So, so, so that, that was a bit of a shock um, and, and, and ended up uh, going there. I had a very good supervisor called Brian Butterworth. Um, uh, and he, he was interested in hesitations and models of linguistic production as well. Uh, fitting in Trinity was interesting. Uh, the, uh, the first thing was um, I was put in a, in a kind of, uh, it was a house with other graduate students. And, uh, and of course, they, 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 you know, all guys, so they all cook for each other. And I said, you know, because I, being a working class <laughs> person from Belfast, uh, I, I'm not so familiar with the kitchen. A uh, bit of a shameful con confession. and. Um, I said, "Oh, you know, I'd love to join your group." So, so, so my girlfriend at the time had written out um, some some uh, some <laughs> a recipe for something that that she knew would would at least allow me not to starve, which was a, a recipe for a potato omelet. So they were all cooking, you know, they're, they're, they, you know, they're, they were all very mixed ethnic backgrounds, you know, the Thai and the Chinese, and, and I went down. I thought, right, I'll be down and uh, I'll, I'll cook my potato omelet. So I go down to the kitchen and I uh, cook my potato omelet. <laughs> I can see them watching me and so on. I don't know paying me so much attention. So I uh, went back up to my room to eat it and cut into it. And um, uh, the potatoes were hard as rocks. And I didn't realize you had to cook the potatoes first. I thought they cooked in the, in the pile. <laughs> so, uh, and I, of course, I asked to join the group and they said, absolutely no way. You seem to be an Irishman <laughs> raw potatoes. <laughs> and the other story I have about my, my dietary habits when I was a child, a child my, my favorite meal. And this is an absolutely true story. And, and, and this is what we call it. My mum would say, what do you want for dinner? Or and, and I'd say, potatoes, raw egg, and raw onions. And that's what we call the meal. Like, uh, you know, like, uh, and the potatoes, raw egg, and raw onions is boiled potatoes. You actually boil the potatoes. Right. You crack two eggs, raw, put them in, and you get a raw onion, chop it up. And I remember describing that to my first girlfriend. She said, I love to cook you a meal. What would you like? I said, potatoes, raw egg, and raw onions. So, uh, I've never heard of that. Uh, I said, it's, it's a typical Belfast thing, just like Belfast, <laughs> and I still have heard of that. So you can see that my, 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 my dietary habits were, were, were always going to be a bit of an issue, and I, I think it was this business. Of, the, the, these people were all quite pretty, pretty sophisticated, you know, it's like, and, and of course, they, you know, they, they, they came from very good universities, of course, from very good universities, and not many were from Birmingham, but even fewer were from Lake Moore Street in Belfast. So I, I stopped talking about, um, well, I didn't talk at all about, about my background. Um, one guy commented on it one day. He said, so weird. You never talk about where you come from. And then right. he said, but I've got a friend who's, uh, I know is from Belfast. And he said, he doesn't talk about it. His dad's a high court judge over there. Oh, right. He said, I bet, I bet it's something similar with you. And I said, yeah, kind of. Something like that. Yeah. But, it, but of course, I mean, Cambridge was, it was a shock in a way because I'd, I'd started you know, get, thinking, oh, you, I'm that's pretty good. And then uh, again, uh, my, my very first seminar, uh, my supervisor had three PhD students. He said, "Would any of you like to present?" I said, "Well, I'll present." And I'd, I'd done this uh, 
extended essay at Birmingham on uh, artificial intelligence, isn't virtual language understanding. I thought, well, I've got to present that one. It's an incredibly high mark now. I remember um, uh, working for the seminar and thinking, hmm, that's kind of difficult. But do I really understand that? You know, it's only when you know you have to talk about something, did some things yes, come to yes. mind. Yeah. And then on the day itself, I walked in and I was expecting some graduate students to be in there, but in they trooped, you know, quite famous psychologists, you know, John Morton, you know, Bernard Comrie, the linguist, Brian Josephson, who got the Nobel Prize for physics when he was in his 20s. I thought, oh my God, what's happening here? And then I started talking and then someone interrupted me about 15 minutes in to stand up. And he said, surely you're not saying. And my whole world collapsed uh-huh. in on me. Oh, oh my goodness me. Uh, because, uh, and then they all started arguing for about an hour. Uh, and yeah. I just sat there, kind of <laughs> withdrawing into myself. And then Brad said, for the year after that, you didn't open your mouth once again. <laughs> and I didn't. I, I never spoke. They said to me, look, if you don't speak, we, we can't invite you. you know? And I was being forced to, to talk. And of course, that, think, that was my. I think that's one of the um, uh, the things in. Uh, uh, as as this is this is for for an academic audience, it's going out to a, to other academics from different things. The 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 becoming an academic is a very sort of um, difficult thing psychologically to do because you're you're meant to go from literally one sort of one day to the next. So suddenly you're you're a member of this club, and um, you're up against people, of course, with all these. Um, bells and whistles and things and 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 you're meant to have an opinion or you're meant to defend a thing and what's what's very difficult of course is um when you you're meant to actually have an opinion and be attacked and but but there's a part of you which which exp- expects almost like here's my idea and you just want people to look at it and um and go that's fantastic wonderful and then say nothing about it which of course if <laughs> what, once, once you've been about a bit would be the ultimate insult if, if somebody displayed oh okay um so yeah. so making that jump from like not being a, a member of the whatever this uh, i suppose the academy to being a member of the academy and, and yours was pretty traumatizing maybe it, it, it was pretty traumatizing and, and, and you, you, again you, you make a couple of interesting points there because I think one aspect of this, you have to learn to deal with it emotionally. Because you know, in right. some sense, it, it, if you do academic work, you're used to getting a little bit of praise and encouragement after a while. But, but, but this business of attack is what academics do. And you have to learn to enjoy it. And, and these days, I kind of love it. I love when people attack me. Right, right. You know, I've learned to enjoy it. Um, and I've also learned to ask my questions. People always say that I've got a very distinctive way of asking questions. And I'm, in seminars, I'm, I'm quite famous. I'm always the one with the sound of growth, unfortunately. But I always do it the same way people say. You always say, that was really interesting. But <laughs> <laughs> I've learned my own distinctive style for doing it. But, 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 but it's almost something that you have to learn to distance yourself from because you can't take it too personally. And as every academic listener will know that if you become too sensitive, then yeah, we know that there are some academics who get very sensitive when, when their papers are critically reviewed. Um, and, and you have to learn. I, I tell my PhD students, but you have to you have to get used to it. And the way you get used to it is you have to you know prepare your work well, um, anticipate some of the issues, and 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 then respond. It's like of course it's, 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 it's complex set of yeah. interpersonal, academic, and emotional skills right. that you have no. to learn in becoming an academic. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's a very difficult one because um, you know, of course, that's what's meant to happen. And you know that's what makes you better, and, and you know that's that's what needs to happen. But at the same time, the way in which it's done, um, just initially, because no one really likes to be, you know, have you know things pointed out. Like if you if you, if you put something on and you go, "How do I look?" and you're, you're doing this to sort of a room, and they're going, "Well." Well, I wouldn't be wearing that shirt. I wouldn't be doing that, and I'd change your haircut, and 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 it and it, it, it can feel like that because you've been um, you presented these ideas that that you care deeply about, and you feel and you believe, etc. So so it's um, it's certainly easier said than done. I mean, d- dealing with criticism, however constructive that criticism might be, is <laughs> I, I think a, a lifelong struggle. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, I mean, I think the thing about the first seminar was I knew it was kind of second time. That, it wasn't what I'd done my dissertation on. I'd done an essay on it, so it allowed me to distance myself. But the thing I'd done my undergraduate dissertation on, which I did my PhD dissertation on, 
uh, I then realized this was an area I could get into and become an expert on. Right. And of course, I became, you know, I dug deep into the numbers. I understood the numbers. I understood the limitations of it. So therefore, when people came with, with, with the difficult questions, at least I had something to say. Um, but, but that first seminar, I have to say, was traumatic. And interestingly, when I was young, I used to stammer a bit. And the stammer came back with okay. a vengeance. With a vengeance. And um, my mum used to say to me, why are you speaking these days? And she said, that's a bloody affectation. English people do. You know, she thought I was doing it for effect. Oh, it was like, okay. interesting. Okay. You know, it's like, and uh, the, the, the words just wouldn't come. And it was like, um, and I know we're going to talk, talk about TV, but when I first did TV, uh, when I first did it, I never knew when the minister was going to come and not. I remember one of the first programs I ever did, um, a very well-known interviewer sat me down. It was an ITV, and it was in the commercial period. And he said, this is the first question I'm going to ask you. And he asked me the question. And I went, uh, bah, 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 bah. And the look of fear on this guy's face was absolutely unbelievable. And he said, excuse me for a second. And I could hear what he was saying to the producer. He said, you didn't tell me he's got stunned in this guy. Right. Um, and anyway, he sat back down. And then he asked me the question for real. We went, we went live. And he asked me the question for real. And I was as fluent as anything. Right. And he said, what were you doing there? Were you just making a joke at my expense? <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. When things are live, I'm okay. But if people say to me, what are you going to say? Right. That makes me very self-conscious. I, I know. That's, that's, okay. Yeah. But, you know, so again, for, for years, it, kind of, it, come, it came and it went. And it, it, sometimes people say, oh, it's still here. It's like, it's like traces of lucky figures because I talk too quick. Okay, well, let's 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 reference that then, because um, uh, we'll 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 move this along by saying so. so um, you you become an academic, but um, you're you're also interested in sort of parallel careers, or, or or rather, you find yourself developing parallel careers. Perhaps 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 you can talk about because you've you've been um, you, you are an academic and you continue to be an academic. You're also a writer. You've done um, literary work. Uh, you've so 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 you've uh, you're an author, and you've also been a journalist. You've been uh, a, a sort of a TV psychologist, a, 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 like a popular psychologist and a popularizer of psychology. Um, so how how did this all come about? Yeah, well, 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 it, it kind of all happened really when I left Cambridge. I, I, I love my time at Cambridge. Yeah, I kind of got used to it and so on. And I, and, uh, I published a lot of papers for my PhD and so on. And so suddenly I'm in Sheffield. Uh, Carol, my first girlfriend, we got married by then. Uh, and, you know, my, my brother's happy, you know, way climbing somewhere. And then suddenly things changed a little bit. My brother died in MLS, so he had a fall. And then Carol slipped below a train at Sheffield Station, was wrong. And the first non-academic writing I did was about Carol's situation. It was called on becoming an artificial arm user. And it was just, again, it was kind of an observation of a human being, you know, an individual affected by a, a, a traumatic situation. That was the first thing I'd written, which wasn't, which wasn't academic. I said the first thing, the first thing I ever did was, when I was 13, I wrote a piece of the hornet after my dad died about being a paper boy. But, so, and it was weird, that, that was the second thing I'd, I'd kind of done. So it was an observation about about you know someone coping with with, with loss and that way, and and so I never found to do it. It was kind of I was kind of driven to do it really. Um, and, and funny enough, uh, um, an academic journal we published the article at the time. It was published in New Society and the Journal of Bad Medical Engineering uh, reproduced it. Uh, and, and and I suppose there was this notion that I'm doing all this academic stuff, but how does it impact on the world? And I was living in Sheffield, of course, at the time, and. And that was the time of Thatcher and 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 the, and the mills, steel mills closing, the coal mines closing, and there was a huge amount of unemployment. And it just so happened that where we lived in Sheffield was that kind of area, and it was like leaving Legmo Street here, you know, or working class area. I was in another working class area now in the north, uh, at, at a time of enormous political change. And and I remember being at the University of Sheffield, and they had some very good occupational psychologists who were talking about the psychological effects of unemployment. I kept thinking, but I'm not really getting out there and talking to these people. Just right. as I was kind of angry that, no, I don't know, I remember, perhaps angry is the right word, that psychologists were talking about the conflict in Belfast, you know, that's something I knew about, but again, they weren't getting out there in the street to find out what was going on. Right. They weren't really getting to these people to look at their lives, you know. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, my neighbor next door, you know, I, I 
in, in Sheffield, you know, he would only go to the supermarket at certain times. He didn't even want the shame or embarrassment of coming into his, his ex colleagues. So they, they're all unemployed. They all avoided each other. So this, is, so this is where you're, you're, you're becoming aware that academia or pure academia is falling short or what you're seeing written, you're, you're, you're going, well, hang on a sec, that, that doesn't make sense. And, and, and you, you, you need the sort of the socio, sociological, uh, social psychological aspects to, to sort of be, be brought to bear. Is that? Is that yeah, it? I mean, it, it, to, 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 to me, this kind of psychological impact of unemployment and so on, you had to know a little bit about people's lives, how they were contextualized, you know, what was driving them, what it felt like, uh, how all the factors uh, went together. And as I say, it, it was an interesting parallel with, with, with the Belfast situation because by that stage, of course, you know, the, the, there had been a lot of killing in, in Northern Ireland. Some of the people I've grown up with have been involved in it, and a number of them had been murdered as well, of course, in the conflict. So, and, and, I, and I was going back to see my mom and we were talking about, you know, I was still seeing the people. And it's like, um, and of course, I've been, the book's called Selfless because by this stage, my mom's now saying, You don't belong here anymore. Be careful what you're saying to people. Right. You know, you, you're a changed boy, you know. Right. These were your friends, but you know. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I've become kind of alienated a little bit from what was going on. And, and, and she was saying, and of course, I was writing about, no, about the conflict as well. And she was saying, Look, you're writing these pieces and uh, writing these articles, and then you're buggering off back to, back to England. Right. I have to live here, you know, and so on. And, um, uh, and I was writing about that, but but I was also writing about about, about Sheffield and, and unemployment and, and the experience of it, and 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 trying to understand how you can still be someone when everything you have got to be taken away from you. And I, I wrote some quite well known pieces about people pretending to be millionaires. You know, when when they, they, you know that one guy had a really old Rolls Royce he'd got for like next to nothing, and the only way he kept it going was to siphon petrol mm-hmm. to put into the car because he knew what. And if he picked up a girl, he'd have to ask her where, where, he, where she lived because he only had enough petrol to go to certain areas. And uh, <laughs> it was like, and, and um, um, you know, I wanted to understand crime and so on. And, and of course, I, 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 I went out with a burglar. And, um, um, and I thought, I want to understand it. You know, there's so much I don't understand. What's it like? Right. You know, what's the fear level like? What's the anxiety like? What, what do they do all day? So I hung a flight with burglar. And, Right. And I thought I had to go to job with him, and we ended up. Uh, I took him to an area of Sheffield. I said, "Which house would you pick?" And he said, "I picked this house." Uh, I said, "How would you get in?" And he said, "I'll get it. This is how I get." He said, "Well, you're not coming with me." I said, "I'll come with you." Yeah. And and uh, you know, I, I wanted to record the whole the experience of working with him. And he, he said, oh, "We'll take." It. I said, "We're not taking anything." Anyway, right. anyway, of course, it was my house. You know, I knew he'd pick my house at that time <laughs> because it was an obvious one. Carol was furious with young kids by then as well. It was like some yeah. burglar made a bloody house. And we went and hauled a Tuesday that the house had been burgled. So, <laughs> but the other hand, I wanted to get close enough to the people, just as I've been, I kind of knew the people in Belfast. I wanted to know the people in Sheffield right. to see what their lives were like. So, so it kind of took me into this kind of old kind of wedding uh, journey. And I started writing for The Guardian. The Guardian, um, I used to write for a page that's called Grassroots. They let me write. Two and a half, three thousand words about these little observations, these vignettes of, of life. And I do it very regularly, sometimes once a fortnight, um, uh, in which I just meet people and hang out with them. Uh, and I did a, a book called Survivors of Steel City, published by Chatterwell Windows, which was kind of looking at, at a city in, you know, affected by unemployment for this kind of close observational writing. But, but I didn't know what it was I was doing, if you see what I mean, because right. I'm still an academic psychologist, I'm still loving psychology but i'm thinking it doesn't really shine a light on on people's lives and and then people would say to me have you left psychology there uh, are you not a psychologist there uh, and obviously i out on the street i wasn't dr jeffrey bd i was just jeffrey bd and then i had the ignominy of someone asking did i know the other jeffrey <laughs> it was like uh, somebody said to me I'm like do you know the guy jeffrey bd writes for the guardian You've yeah i've heard nasty list. things about him <laughs> <laughs> Don't trust him. Don't no trust him. Uh, you never know what he gets up to. But it's like, so it, it was really kind of almost like a splitting of personality. It was right, like, right. again, two sets of individuals, the academics I was dealing with on a daily basis, and then these other guys. And I, I, I took up boxing. I wanted them to analyze the boxers. And right, again, right. you oh, well, we'll just go to the gym and write about it. For goodness sake. But of course, the way I did it was I, got, I, I knew some bouncers very well, and they were all ex-boxers, and some of them had been pretty good. 
Um, and, and I said, yeah, I got chatting to them. I, you know, I still did a lot of sport, um, did a bit of running. And um, they said, you know, I said, oh, what's it like being a boxer? Well, come down to the gym with us, Jeff. We'll uh, show you what it's like. I said, fair enough. Yeah, okay. Well, I thought we'd go down and do a few bench presses, go for a run, and we'll be good. And they said, have you ever done any bag work? And I said, no. Mom Terrence had been a boxer, by the way. So he, he'd show me a little bit when I was a child. But they said, okay, here's a bit of bag work. So you've got a great right hand, Jeff. A great right hand. <laughs> and he said, have you ever done any sparring? I said, no, I'm not going to get in the ring. We'll, we'll, we'll give you a go. And of course, I got in the ring, got battered. And I had a, squ- I had a squash match that night. I took my shirt off. And somebody said, oh, Jesus, have you been in a car accident? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah, my back was, my back it was so bruised. It's like, what are you doing? Are you running for people? It's good for right. you. You're on the ropes, you're in the back of your back. Uh, but of course, I mean, and that was my way of getting their respect. And then, and, right. and right. Brendan, Brendan Ingalls, Jim in Winterbank, famous. Oh, wow. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Nazim Mohammed, Harold Graham, Johnny right. Nelson, and so on. And Brendan, you said, for God's sake, don't let them use you. I became good friends with Brendan. Don't let them use you as a punch bag. But, um, but I've got their respect. So right. uh, I would go to weigh ins with people. I would, you know, I would spend the day with them, you know. So I, I ended up doing two books about. The lives of boxers, one called On the Ropes, and one called The Shadows of Boxing. But I was close enough to observe the action. And if you watch some of the Nazi Muhammad fights, you see this guy <laughs> sitting in the. I used to sit ringside, you know. Uh, okay. Okay. So you'll, you'll see me. You'll see me there. Fantastic. Okay. So, 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 in in essence, then, while while just to go back to what you just said about people going, well, is it the two different two different beaties? One's a one's a sort of like. Sort of popular journalist, and the other person's an academic. But you, you in actual fact, saw these as very much um, comp- one complementing the other. In actual fact, being perhaps essential one to the other. Well, it was a little bit uncomfortable, I have to say, because I couldn't think of how to reconcile them. And, and Survivors of Stood City was funny because by that stage, I'd met Irving Goffman, who of course was a brilliant yes. academic and a brilliant writer. Um, uh, I, I was introduced to him, uh, and I finished Survivors with a chapter. Uh, which I tried to pull them together using a kind of Goffman esque perspective, a kind of dramaturgical perspective about. Uh, and I don't know how successful it was, but I felt I had to do it because I still had to right. had to try and be that that academic, you know. And, I, and I, in the other books, I got the comments to say, "Look, I'm just going to leave academic stuff separate." Um, but I knew, it, you know, I could see that it was. Uh, it was tricky because people couldn't really think of how the two bits get, got together. And, and it was all because I, <laughs> as an academic psychologist, as a psycholinguist, I f- had famously analyzed Thatcher's speeches and did a kind of forensic analysis or turn taking right. in them and, and so on. And this was published in Nature, which of course is a big yes, uh, yes. Very journal. So I was doing that <laughs> on the one hand. On the other hand, I was. Talking, going burglary with with people who were victims of Thatcher. It was very odd, and right. I kept thinking, imagine if I tried to explain yes my Thatcher analyses to the to the people I was hanging out with and writing about their lives. It didn't make sense. In a sense, it was like it was yes. a very odd juxtaposition of, of right, stuff. Right. Really, it right. was, um, and, and I couldn't think of many people who 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 I'm sure there are, there are, but I I didn't know them. Who'd, to try to do something kind of similar, which was how do you write about lives on the one hand, and then make you know, I, I, and of course these days, you know, when I lecture to students and I say, okay, let's talk about the psychology of terrorism, you know, and instead of an abstract thing, I say, oh, here are, here are some face-to-face interviews I've done. Let's analyze carefully what's being said here. Right. Let's think about it's crime. Okay, blah blah blah. And, you see, I've got, it's given me like, almost like a library of material. So I recorded yes. everything. Right, right, um, right. And yeah, that, so, that, that also links, I think, very much with with auth- authenticity. Um, in because 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 I I think the, there's been a far greater recognition, or there is a far greater recognition now of um, those sorts of studies, which which do involve a lot more empirical sort of research. And, and indeed, it's it's almost sort of the other way around. If you were to just um, you know, purely theoretical and purely stuff that you had conducted in the lab you 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 probably no one would sort of think it held much water um but so i'm, I'm just cognizant of the time we're just um of uh you're you okay for another 
a few few minutes. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, you're 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 absolutely right because it's been a big paradigm shift in psychology and qualitative research, and ethnography, and discourse analysis, conversation analysis. I mean, at the time that they were just you know kind of embryonic at, at the very you know, at, at the most, really. Um, and, and 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 there has been a been a, a massive transition where where this is all suddenly respectable. And at the time, I wasn't even sure what I was doing. People said, "Is it journalism? Is it reportage? What is it? Right. Is it ethnography like they do in sociology?" But I, I wasn't necessarily that familiar. It's an anthropology, you know. Right. Uh, and I suppose what I wanted to do was to all the people you know, up as I went along, really. Um, and and obviously, as an academic now, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I think one of my critiques of of, of, of perennial critiques of psychology is very inward looking, very narrow. And I think there are all kinds of really interesting disciplines all around it, which right. we need to draw on, really. Right. Um, so I spend a lot of my time doing stuff other than psychology these days. Right. And perhaps it wouldn't have been such a such a, a rupture at the time if I'd known about this, but at the time I didn't. And all, all I knew was there's the world of experience and there's the world of psychology, right. and the two things rarely connect. And I, I, I I need to have a foot in both camps, really. Well, that, that, that's, that's a, an interesting segue then into the Big Brother world. Because um, this, this in um, because uh, you you were a psychologist who worked on on the Big Brother show, um, and for those people who who don't know, Big Brother is a is a setup where they they put different uh, people in in a house, and everything's filmed, and then they they um, they have to stay within that house until they're until they're evicted by 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 popular sort of vote. And um, and when they're within the house, uh, what, what happens? There's sort of like a, a number of, of of different sort of experiments, or or I suppose. No, yeah, they, 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 they're, they're given a number of tasks which, which uh, and challenges. And the idea behind the tasks and challenges was that they should be psychologically revealing in some way. Um, and, and it's interesting because well, I, 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 in the year two thousand, I was invited along to. To, to, to this kind of studio in London to, to, to see the kind of pilot for the film. And it looked like a, I'd done a few similar kind of TV programs at the time with filming people. And it looked like one of those kind of low budget, you know, minimal interest programs. Um, and, and, and my interest was, was, was pretty straightforward, really, which was I, uh, in terms of my PhD, in terms of my academic psychology, I was interested in the kind of microanalysis of behavior, how nonverbal behavior fits with speech and how that fits with. With models of processing, and, and and of course my PhD at Cambridge um, wasn't so much lab based. What I did was I filmed tutorials and seminars at Cambridge, which of right. course are natural, both natural interactions right. to, to microanalyze them. And of course, Big Brother was saying to me, "Look, we're going to be filming things twenty four seven, and you can have the tips." And I thought, "Wow!" And of course, I'll, and we're going to link that to the broader social processes of group formation. Um, uh, stereotyping, solidarity, gossip. And I thought it's a way of joining up these different levels of behavior. I'm going to have all of this behavior to analyze. Um, and I'm going to ha have the chance to link it to how the groups are working. So it, it was a weird attempt to, to combine the, the, the right. two things. So I, I started working in 2000. I worked on all 11 series of, of, of uh, Big Brother and Channel 4, which is when the psychology was, was quite, uh, quite a serious component. Now, of course, it wasn't without its critics. I mean, people were saying, um, oh, why should academics be connected with this program? But of course, what I was having a chance to do was to was to get some interesting views about psychology out there. I remember maybe a second or third series, I started talking about my work on iconic gesture. <laughs> and I had to explain to Mr. Big Brother himself uh, what this stuff was all about. And I remember him thinking, God, he said, that sounds really... And I was explaining about you know, the idea of, of an imagistic code which accompanies speech and how we process it and how to do with um, the underlying representations, thinking and how that connects to, to articulation. He said, well, this is all really interesting. He said, can you explain that to 7 million people? I said, I think I can, yeah. <laughs> and uh, every week I'd be analysing the gestural movement. And this ended up in an academic book called Visible Thought, which was published by Routledge, which has got quite a lot of citations, uh, in which the examples are from Big Brother because right. it was like an amazing opportunity to to kind did, of study behavior in that way. It's it's an amazing opportunity, but did did you not have any reservations about um uh about Big Brother as a sort of a concept and as in, in terms of what you were doing? Because I'm 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 just thinking obviously like we, we know what the idea of Big Brother is, you know, in the Orwellian sense, 
Um, we also know, you know, there's these different ministries and there's these people sort of controlling or or sort of, and, and, and there was certainly that aspect because obviously there was producers wanted to see fights or meltdowns or, or, or various things. Uh, but also the the key um, the key driver was was a sort of um, quite li literally sort of an ostracism with, through an eviction. Um, so did did you have any sort of reservations? Because I mean your your your, your whole is, and we've we've covered these points within um, within the uh, the conversation today. Were, were there were some uncomfortable parallels. What, what is it? I mean, it's interesting because in retrospect. I can see all kinds of issues that have arisen from Big Brother. And, and, and they're big issues, by the way, not necessarily at the level of the individual. At the time, the way I thought about it, the way I justified it to myself, I was thinking that I'm spending, at the time, just before Big Brother, those four years, with boxers, working class people who need a way out of right. the gutter. You know, right. I say gutter uh, because famously a teacher at my school said, be you from the gutter and you're going to end up there. So I thought, okay, other people like me, I either education is a way out. Boxers have got a way out. And there's all people, as you know, who would like to plan it, but I keep thinking, you can, and I kept thinking, these people, what's their way out? And, and what they're going to do is they're going to do a program with, which is a few weeks, incredible psychological aftercare. Um, they can leave at any time, um, but it gives them a shot at something. And, and in my naive way at the time, that's what I thought. It gives me a shot at something. Uh, they were pre-warned about, you know, the kinds of things, you know, by the, you know, the eviction show. Uh, for most people, the eviction was neither here nor there. You know, in fact, they couldn't wait to get out to, to make a bit of money, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and generally speaking, it, it was fine. Now, in retrospect, I suppose what I didn't quite get would be the start of something enormous, you know, reality television. Right. Uh, and the growth of narcissism and the growth that everybody has to be in the picture. And I went to the gym last night and almost everyone in the gym was filming themselves while they were doing right. the exercise. Right. And, and did I foresee that? I don't think I did, you know. I don't think I saw that extraordinary change over the last two decades, which is right. the only way any of us exist any longer is to go in front of the camera yes. and to get facts and so on. And it's this, this, you know, some people refer to it as a narcissism pandemic, but it, but it is extraordinary the way it's changed life. I just thought it was going to be a show that that would give a few people, you know, a few moments of, of opportunity, right. and then it would be gone. I didn't realize it was going to change the whole the, the whole society, and uh, not necessarily uh, for the better. Um, and and the way it worked on Big Brother was they had psychologists who analysed the action in the house, and then another set of psychologists, quite separate, who who looked after the well-being. I thought. And the people who I thought were doing the well being thought were very good. Right. So I, I thought, you know, and, uh, you know, certainly in those first sets of series, you know, there, 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 were, there were some interesting moments, but uh, no more interesting than you might have a, in a house in Belfast on a Saturday night <laughs> 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 in terms of disturbances. You know, people got a bit angry uh, and then they calmed down. It's like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I, 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 some, some of them have got a, got a library who have you know what I mean? Yes, so, yes, yes. Uh, so um, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so um, as as we as we draw um, this this to a close, then the the end of the book, and it's um, uh, and it, it is a wonderful book, very 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 touching book, a very interesting book, um, beautifully written, and um, and, and a real page turn. I, I read it in um, in a couple of days, and. Um, uh, there's there's lots of people who who in actual fact um, say have, have you read my book and of course the uh, most people the answer is no but this this is a fantastic <laughs> book so uh, do 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 please read it and at the end of this we'll we'll um, put up the information there. Um, the the final chapter is called reckonings and um, reconciliations and I suppose um, the, uh, the 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 question that we're sort of or, or that we've been dealing with throughout this, I suppose, is, is do, you, do you feel that you've reconciled yourself with yourself? Do you feel reconciled with, um, do you feel the disparate or, or different parts of who you are and what you are? Do you feel that they are reconciled in in the self or do you, or do you still struggle with that? Well, well, of course, as you said, the book's called Selfless. I mean, it's not that I, I, I care so much about others. It's, it's this concept, do, do you end up with the concept of self? And, um, um, 
I, I suppose I feel more reconciled than I once did. I mean, I, I think for many years uh, the, 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 there was certainly a, a kind of bit of a disjunction there. And, and, and again, in the book, I, I document how I, you know, the psychology I was learning was I was trying to use it on my own family, my own mother, you know. Uh, and and the, last, you know, the last chapter is about the double bind, you know, you know, a lecturer saying, oh, you know, mothers, you know, they really mess you up. You know, you have to go out for the double bind, you know. Right. Uh, and I, I try to describe how she's, you know, using these contradictory communications and put me in an impossible situation and so on. And, you know, it's, it's pretty, yeah, and I suspect that's not uncommon for, for, for people learning psychology to kind of use it on those around and those they love, really. Um, and, and I think it was, it was it was quite difficult for a while. And, and and what I try to do is then use the academic psychology and then kind of look at the concept and say, look, it's a, you know, it is it a good concept or is it not such a good concept? So so I I think there was all that to kind of deal with. Um, uh, I suppose for many years I hadn't really talked about my background, and then after I became more established in academia, I became quite. Well, Proud of my background, so I started taking my mother with me to the things, which is quite funny. Uh, it's a great anecdote there. The work of the for a literary prize, and uh, which was won by Brian Keenan, the, the, the Beirut hostage for a brilliant book called *The Evil Cradle*. And Brian Keenan, of course, had been held captive in a basement in Beirut for many years. And um, my mum didn't know, know who she was, who, who he was, but, but they got on very well. Right. Uh, and he talked in a very quiet voice because he'd been punished for talking loudly. She kept saying, Gran, speak up. I can't hear you. <laughs> and then uh, she said, what's your book about, Bran? And uh, he told her, so Jesus, Bran, I know what it's like. I never get out of it. Uh, so, <laughs> it was like, so I took her, I took her to things, which was quite funny. And um, she, came, she came to watch me lecturing and so on. And you know what you do at the start of a lecture? You talk to people in front of them. So, what are you talking about, those girls? Do you really chat with them all the time? I said, I wasn't chatting them up. They were asking about my academic work. I didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so there's all that kind of bringing her back into my life, too, which was which was which was great. Um, but you know, I, I, I suspect that what psychology, you know, and, and this is going to be such a such a naive conclusion. But I think after my father died, it, it kind of drove the two of us apart, really, because we we both got a terrible amount of grief to deal with, um, and we tried to deal with it separately and independently. You know, we didn't know how to. You know, because sometimes there are, there, are, there are blockages which stop you sharing and, and trying to look after each other. And I was only a young boy. Uh, and my mum was, was just overcome with grief, as, as was I. And I, I think, you know, uh, and I think when that happens, it, it then directs you in, in certain kinds of ways. So, so I suspect it's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of reflecting on, on the way things could have worked out differently. And, and, and I suppose, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand how you end up, and of course, I, I do end up, you know, Dostoevsky, there's a bit of a rule, as do other Russian authors in, in the book, uh, and of course, you know, the psychology of Dostoevsky, and the of splitting and so on, uh, and I, I, I suspect what I was trying to do was to, early in the book, I talk about notes from underground, and, you know, and, and, you know, and the way the character, the way the character is, and, 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 and in some sense, what great psychology is compared to some of the academic psychology right. I've read, and, and, and I suspect that Towards the end of the book, I'm I'm I'm, I'm reconciling myself to, to you know, to, 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 to re-reflecting on that and kind of thinking about about it in a way. And, and when I'm feeling optimistic, I keep thinking I'm, I'm not I'm not kind of split really in 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 that kind of way really. It, rather, what it is, so I've, I've got a good understanding of academic psychology and and, and the techniques and methods and conceptual apparatus it uses to think about the social world and people. So I, I kind of get all that and I can do it and I can do it in an objective way and I can do it in a, you know, you know. But at the same time, I have a, a feeling for human beings. You know, I, I like human beings. You know, I enjoy life. You know, I want to connect with people. And um, uh, and the big challenge is, um, is drawing those two things together, really. Um, um, and, and, and maybe, so I, I keep thinking, well, maybe I've got to put in both camps. I've got to, an understanding of both, and 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 that therein lies something kind of interesting and novel and so on, and 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 it's really finding a way of of, of combining the two in a way that it doesn't stand out. You think, oh my God, he's he's moving between the different 
this different personas here. Oh, here comes my God, here comes academic people again. It's like, you know, and, and, and that, that's the challenge of the writing, really, you know, mm. uh, to, to combine the two, you know. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm certainly more reconciled than I was. So, you know, it, it, it's a work in progress. It's exactly, it, 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 it is work in progress. Okay, well, Jeff, thank you so much for um, giving up your time to uh, to talk to us. And um, uh, for for those of you watching, um, please please do um, order your copy now. Um, we'll put the, the the details there of uh, of, Jeff, of Jeff's book. It's a fantastic book, and um, it, it covers uh, a whole range of different sort of uh, disciplines and interdisciplines. So so do get your copy now, Jeff. Thank you very much.